I had this intuition about a year and a half ago. I was standing on my balcony at the Shangri-La Hotel in Santa Monica, and I was staring at the ocean, the sand, the trees, the mountains, the stars. All of a sudden, it occurred to me. I understood. I knew how it all started. How what started? The cosmos. The universe? Yeah. With the orgasmic explosion of God. And that's the basis for this movie that I want to make and that I want you to put the money up for. Orgasmic explosion of God? Right. My colleagues in astronomy have uh, named an asteroid after me. I am number, out in space, 2844 Hess halfway between Mars and Jupiter. I want to be a pediatric doctor, and I want to serve in an under, underdeveloped area anywhere in the world. If I couldn't play sports, I would read books and play with my computer. What films have you made? Flashdance, Beverly Hills Cop, the first one, Top Gun, the only one, and Beverly Hills Cop 2. How much is this movie going to cost? Uh, very little. Very little, but in dollars and cents, how much is very little? It's, it's, I mean, less than, less than anything else is costing. And what you're getting is a movie. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I like any kind of crazy technical writing about things blowing up, um, all that stuff. Writing about it or the, yeah, I love or the writing action? about it. What do you want to be when you grow up? A scientist or artist. Well, I had really uh, nothing in life uh, before I started painting. I did a couple of armed robberies in my life. I paid for them. I did what I had to do. Did you ever go to jail? Yeah. How many times? A few times. Did you, uh, did you kill? Did I what? Let me see the screen. Uh, there, 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 there is no script. No script? No. I'm a writer. What have you written? Oh, well, I've written books, plays, essays, screenplays, a great deal of pretentious rubbish for the most part, some of which was pretty good. Has your restaurant served as a second home to people, do you think? Oh, I know it has. Who are the actors? The, well, in the conventional sense, there are no actors. I think Daryl's a great basketball player. My man. <laughs> <laughs> He's a good dunker, and, my man, my and the Detroit Pistons, and I'm mad at him because he knocked down Larry Bird. <laughs> yeah, well, see, Larry Bird got in the way. He's a nice guy, but when he get in the way, and all I see is two points and a paycheck, I run over him. Andre the Giant, I run over him. You heard Andre the Giant? I'm a faculty member at Marymount Manhattan College in New York City. I'm also a member of a women's religious community. Which is what? Which is what? <laughs> the which religious community? It's called Religious of the Sacred Heart of Mary. And um, does that mean that you would also be commonly referred to as a nun? That's correct. No script, no actors. What, what, what's the story about? There is also no story. It's really uh, a movie about the people who are in it, uh, about creation and disintegration, God, life, love, sex, crime, madness, death, everything. Wait a minute, wait a minute. We were taken, the Jews of my town, as more all the Jews in Hungary were uh, taken to Auschwitz or to other death camps. I was the light heavyweight champion of the world boxing. I was the author of a book on the life of Muhammad Ali called 
staying like a bee? Husband made was not something that I had planned to do in my life. It was something I just fell into because I was very young and I was in one situation trying to get into another. I feel fortunate that I'm someone who can say I'm a wife and mother first. Like to, I mean, if I could do anything I wanted to do, I'd, I'd write music, I'd um, write scores, but I just don't really um, think in sound that way, and so I sort of use words. It's, it's not going to be a profitable movie. Um, what's in it for me? The possibility that 200 years after you're dead, the only reason anyone will know you are on this planet is that your name will be on the screen as the producer of imagination is the start a, a wish a wanting to know i remember that in my own experience when my father took me out in the backyard and showed me the milky way that kindled an interest to know more to learn more to find out what is this that I see? What am I looking at? And how long has it been there? How did it get started? Why is it here? You're asking me? Yeah. <laughs> I have no idea. You'd have to ask my brother the priest. The cosmos? I know exactly when it started. February 18th, 1934. Coincidental with my birthday. At the beginning of it all, there was what astrophysicists and cosmologists choose to call a singularity. Now this was an accumulation of energy in essentially no space at all. There must have been always something, some, you know, the, you know, cosmic soup or whatever they described that some little spark happened to ignite and made some other stuff. Um, but I mean, I could easily be persuaded that that's more irrational than thinking that something just happened out of nothing. Can you imagine nothing? Because I can't imagine infinity, nor can I imagine nothing. The beginnings in my own life were uh, always beginnings of love, and I, I hope that, that is, that's somehow what happened when this cosmos came into being. If there's an isness, it always was is, and it always will be is, and it ain't going to be less than or more than. And from that unbelievably small beginning, it burst forth in all of its whiteness, because it was so hot, brilliant, expanding at fantastic speed out into nothingness. Until then, there was no space. There was no time. There was nothing. Do you imagine that there was a beginning to the universe or that it always existed? Um, I don't really wonder an awful lot about that, I'll be honest with uh. you. Um, I think you know, more than likely, it probably didn't have a beginning. Or maybe, um, I don't know. I, I just don't know. And I believe everything that was written in the Bible is true, too. What about that the earth was created by God in six days and that he rested on the seventh? I believe that. I always like to look at it as, a, as something with four corners. Like, this, there's an end to the cosmos. And as it expanded, it began to uh, accumulate into lumps, to accrete. And these then gave rise, ultimately, to subatomic particles. Now, some were positive and some were negative in electrical charge. I have a conflict because I, w I was uh, raised a very strong Catholic, you know, my mother and father. So the Adam and Eve situation and the, and the rain for 33 days and the animals, uh, and then when I went to school, I learned the, the, the evolutionary uh, theory, theory of evolution, and I tried to tie them together. First there was a piece of dust, and there was a squirrel, then there was a dog, then there was a cat, then there was... Shock waves and gravity, and all of that leading ultimately to the development of stars stars, individual masses of this gas, 
that were capable of being squeezed by gravity until the temperature within them soared to millions of degrees. I think there was a big bang, then galaxies were created, then birth of the stars, and then, and then the Earth was created, and then... Gravity took over once again, squeezed that star one more time, squeezed it hot, squeezed it small, squeezed it so that it became unstable blew itself apart in one catastrophic explosion. A cosmic explosion of God. What do you think about orgasm? I'd say 50% of the New Yorkers who ride the subway every day have it just from the back and forth movement. Orgasm appears in the paintings very often by, by drip, uh, droplets of uh, uh, acrylic. People say, oh my God, you come all over your, your canvas, what's that? <laughs> and I, th of course, I feel pretty good at this stage of the game. You know, the more driblets I have, the more potent I am. <laughs> of man has to find some satisfaction for everything that it sees and realizes and achieves. It was at one time an important concept that anything that was made from the earth fell back to the earth if you let it drop. And people said it's the nature of it to do that. Things of the earth to return to the earth. And when there were downpours of rain and all the water gathered together in streams and rivulets and into rivers, it eventually worked its way to the sea. And people said, well, it's the nature of liquid to return to the sea. One time in Puerto Rico, when I was about 11, uh, there, were, there was a lot of rain. And young boys and girls used to go to the river to see, to see animals come by, you know, swimming the because, of the, because of the river. And I jumped to save a kid. And when I was getting into the kid, I, I was going down, and I thought I was going to die. And I began to pray in, in about, I don't know, 20 seconds or 30 seconds. When I, when I opened my eyes, I was like half a mile from the place I was, and I was saved. And from then on, I believed that there was something mysterious. And then Newton said, aha, the reason that that falls, that's gravity. And everybody said, well, Isaac Newton is a very bright man. And if he says it's gravity, it must be gravity. And so they quit saying nature, and they started saying gravity. But you know, I have a suspicion that the word gravity, to most people, doesn't mean any more than nature did to people years ago. You don't believe that the universe is just matter, particles, chemicals, uh, elements in time and in space, with no purpose, no design, other than scientific laws? No. You believe there is something conscious there? Yeah, something conscious, yeah. Do you believe in God? You gotta ask me that. Where is this higher being? Somewhere out there, man. He's in heaven. And it's up there somewhere, beyond the universe and the stars. Where is he? He's in my heart. You know, I mean, I'm not saying uh, God's wearing a Stetson hat in Dallas, Texas this afternoon, but... Uh, uh, wherever there's life, there's God. Where there's electricity, there's God, I would think. Something else is happening other than just what's going on in this room, what's going on, you know, in, in, in life, in quotes. If not, it's the cruelest joke ever perpetrated on, on, you know, civilization. You don't know that there really is a God. I have not seen him, but I believe. I've seen him too many times to believe in him. The last time was in Baltimore in a hotel. He was in the lobby. 
arguing about the size of his room. Do you believe in God? Um, yeah, actually, yes. Where is he? Who is he? What is he? Um, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I, um, I think the categories are probably uh, not ones I would accept any longer, that, it's, uh, that we can talk about where God is, that we talk about God as Him. You should just say it because the other person would know that, like, at the beginning you should say God, and then in the middle you can say it or God. Oh, I see. So you don't have to say man or woman because he probably isn't one. The ancient Hebraic tradition which refused to sort of speak the name of God is possibly uh, a little bit closer to uh, what I would see as a way of uh, maybe handling some of that not reducing God to our names. Dostoevsky has a line, uh, if God does not exist, then everything is possible. Exactly. And then when all things are possible, this would be a, a crazy, crazy mixed up world. Because then everybody do what they want to do, feel the way they want to feel, commit crimes and not feel. I mean, if, if there wasn't the religious people in this world who felt, well, I'm not going to go out here and kill, or I'm not going to abort a baby, or I'm not going to do anything so wrong that has to do with the church, then this world would be just crime, punishment, and like a barbaric place to be. The way you keep people in line is to scare the shit out of them and tell them the only way they're going to escape this fucking fear is by believing in something that you know all about. I, I would never be here if there wasn't something bigger than us all. The scientists and I believe that we were created by apes. Apes. We were what scientists? What? What scientists? The, the scientists on, on my surface. Yeah, but where, is the, where did the scientists come from? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> oh, you're the scientist, huh? No. But you say the scientists and yourself. I'm talking about the scientists said that we were um, resolved by apes. What scientists? Sydney, my dad's friend, I think. Sydney, is, your dad has a friend that's a scientist? Yeah. I want to see right. your dad when this is over. The nerve of him to teach kids this kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you come from? Well, I went, I, I was in heaven, and I flew around to Egypt, to Spain, <laughs> to uh, Germany, to America, all over the world. And then I found my mother. She was one of the people who I thought would be nice, and she didn't have any children. Maybe my idea of the Big Bang as the orgasmic explosion of God spreading out endlessly in time and space isn't any crazier than anybody else's idea of creation. I mean, the five billion people on Earth all began as orgasmic explosion, so why not the cosmos as well? Do you think I'm insane for believing that? No, I think you're not very insane. Uh, quite safe, you are. Uh, you see, we have to search for ways of expressing these things that we observe, that we live. I don't know if we'll ever get the right set of words to do it. <laughs> to be honest with you, I'm <laughs> glad they let me come from wherever I came from, because I couldn't stay where I was much longer. And where was that? Love Tron, 100 Alnaspeer light years from here. Most people say, like, that men came first, but probably a man and a woman came first, or else, like, then nobody would be born, and then there would still be one person on Earth, and then that when that person dies, then there's nobody. Love trying. It's so, it's a long way from here. It consists of mostly ladies. But they have to have one king to run the planet, so I take me and a few of my brothers over there and we tighten things up over there. 
there is something about um, sex when you with particular people where you feel as though you're meeting it as, as children and and even perhaps before that that you're coming from a sort of pre-verbal state I mean I always think of that we're aliens and we've kind of come and met each other and we happen to be male and female but we didn't have to be male and female I mean it's just sort of assumed roles that we have now when did you start being sexually obsessed when I was about five or six I always had it in the back of my mind my grandmother and mother was raising me and they had me in the church and and um, after church was over, I'd come home and think all kind of things. And I thought something was wrong with me at first. By the time Sunday school had become a big part of my life, and I was leading Sunday school, and I also noticed at the age of 10 the distaff gender, a major complication occurred in my life. It was tough, you know, walking around with a Bible in one hand and my libido in the other. I had a lot of freedom to go to different places, meet different people, spend the night here, spend the night there. And my mother and my whole family had confidence in me that I was always doing the right things. I never had, did anything to let them believe otherwise. So I did have sex very young for me, I think it was, which was the age of 11. I fell in love with a little girl in the neighborhood about three months after I got married. It's really hard for me to explain. I just went downhill from there. It was an eventual divorce. And that's why my kids and me are not that close. And I wish I could have changed that somewhere along the line. A lot of people say to me, oh, you must hate men because of your father. He left you at such a young age and everything. I don't think I hate men. I think that I don't trust men. I think there's that that's very, uh, very visible in my mind. I don't trust men. Um, sexually, I, I love men. Well, I try every move. I cook dinner. I go to movies. I hold hands. I walk through parks. I go by setting sheets. I write poetry. I lay in the bed. I tell lies. I do whatever I got to do to get the job done. Like most men do, but they say, oh no, honey, I didn't lie to you. I lied. Our pastor on a prayer meeting night had, had gotten me in the corner of this, uh, this cold, dank basement. And um, he'd, become, he'd become aware that I'd been looking at the ladies in church. Not the girls, but the ladies. I guess I wanted the mothers. I don't know where I was coming from. There was a hierarchy. I mean, everybody had his or her sweetheart. And uh, in fact, yes, there was a, a, a shed somewhere in the camp, and we knew about it. And I do remember, in fact, that I was so hungry as were the other girls, that we loitered around. And I was a young girl, and I was a virgin when I went into Auschwitz. And I tell you that if somebody would have come to me and say, here is an extra piece of bread, I would have accepted it. I felt that I had to, because the guys, they wanted to. And I felt it was my duty to do this. And it was wrong. I mean, now I want to kick myself because I didn't have to. But it's like I was so, such a nice girl. I'm still a nice girl. And I would give because I know this person will feel good by it and enjoy it, even if I'm not going to enjoy it. That's how nice I am. There was a particular girl named Charlene Turner who was a friend of mine, and he made a comment about I was, you know, apparently lusting after Charlene Turner. I remind you, I was 10 years old. And I said, well, yeah. And, you know, this is a guy I could trust. This is a man who my whole life had been my my uh, kind of quasi-mentor and, and moral benefactor. And I, so I, I told the truth to Minister Cully. I said, I have these thoughts, I have these feelings, and, uh, and what do you think? He said, if you think about it beyond this moment, God will strike you. And if you do anything about it, you will live in hell forever. At that moment, I said, I'm going to play Little League and get laid. This is bullshit. I was madly in love with this girl. I mean, I was madly in love with her. I left my wife for her, left my two kids for her. Don't ask me why. I, I used to just, I was quiet around her. But the moment, the, the moment somebody would look at her, or I would think they were looking at her, or, or maybe, maybe even you're right, maybe I wanted, I wanted to, 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 to show her that I was in her defense. I, I, I gave a lot of guys beatings for her. 
I felt that in order for me to be champion of the world, I had to be an ob objective, impersonal, uh, distant uh, human beings. I have to detach myself of any emotion. You know, like when you meet a lady and she says, well, would you like to make love? Well, the first thing I'd like to do is fuck, not make love. I feel good making love to men, not screwing men. I don't want to come home and the wife meet me at the door with a drink. Here. And my suit can be all over the house. When I come in the house, I'm horny as fuck. I'm ready to get busy. I don't want to be talking about, well, where are we going for dinner? Where are we going for dinner? After I get this, then we'll talk about dinner. I don't know. I've always been like that. I, I just can't help it. Well, I've had sexual fantasies about women because I find women are sensitive and and beautiful and I find that women somehow are more into being emotional than men can be sometimes. There's a lot of pretty women that I've always admired and I was like, oh my God, she's just so beautiful that you, I don't know if it's putting myself into her body and maybe feeling this beauty and then getting enticed by it or just by looking at her, I'm really just getting a feeling that I wish I can touch her or be with her. We were in, we were in the Sheep's Head Bay one night, in Joe's Clam Bar. And I was inside getting cigarettes. And uh, she was outside uh, ordering whatever. And some sailor came by and was talking to her. And I freaked out. And I'm telling you, I freaked out. So I said, well, it'd be better if we go somewhere more private where I still say your parents don't walk in on us since they're in the next room. So he said in the basement. <laughs> so we went into his basement. And they had old, um, an old mattress down there, too. And he laid it down, and we got down. And he said, well, I would, I would like to make, you know, make love to you. And I said, OK, sure. I'll do this for you. <laughs> I went outside, and I just started wailing on him. But I mean, I gave him a beating. I mean, I, I, mean, I overdid it, you know. I wasn't in my right head. I mean, it was a bad, bad time in my life. That's why I'm, I'm telling you about it. And I'm not ashamed of it. I am ashamed of it, but uh, this helps me. When I was done, giving him that beating, I threw him over, over the, the rail into the water, into the bay, and he hit the boat. There was a, there was a fishing boat there, he hit the boat, and uh, I don't even know to this day what happened to this guy. I just took him and I ran, got in the cab and disappeared. Was your girlfriend with you? When yeah, you... yeah. What'd she say? She was hugging me and kissing me. Is that crazy? I was on the bottom, he was on top, and I was trying to direct him to where to put his dick in. And he just started saying, ow, ow. <laughs> it started to hurt him. And it was so tiny and, and weak. And it was like bending in my arm. I'm trying to get it. Like it was, he was, he did have an erection, but it was still so soft because he was so young. I have no explanation for, for my actions. How do you explain her abandoning you when you got arrested? I, I have none for that. And I used to think when I was in prison, how could she have done this to me? I mean, I would have died for it. I would have stood there and you could have put a bullet in my brain. You could have shot me from the toes to my nose. I would have never said peep. He never entered me, but I made him believe he did because <laughs> it was just so painful for him. And then I was getting a little frustrated with him and because I was getting turned on. And this guy couldn't help me no, in any way. So I just said, OK. It's in. And he was like, it's in, it's in. The first six months in the can, I had a real bad time. I was mad, madly in love with her. And she didn't come to see me. She didn't even stand in the back of the court and wave goodbye to me when I went away. And for the first six months in the can, I was, yeah, you didn't want to know me. I was a dangerous, dangerous kid. And then one morning I woke up and then I could breathe again. It was gone. It was all over. The best day of my life was the day I've I fell out of love with that girl.
you have lived a life of celibacy, is that not true? Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, has that been a, a struggle or, or just a given? Um, it differs at times. Sometimes it, it's quite fine when I look around. <laughs> at other times, it's quite a struggle. So it varies, you know. How about love? How important is love in your life? It's been very important. Not so important now. I think it's a much abused term and, a much, and a word freighted with much too, responsibility, much too much responsibility. But insofar as one can, one can have affection, friendship, yeah, those are things I believe in. It was love and sex that enabled my husband and I to, to create um, the beautiful children that we have. Love is not something I understand. Love is something that, that in my experience, has always seemed distant and fleeting, and that kind of gossamer-like goal that a lot of people are intently pursuing. So I've never pursued it. My position has always been, if it occurs, great. Give me some of that. Do you think it's possible to fall in love with one person, be faithful, and remain that way permanently? Oh, sure. Is that some kind of ideal in your mind? Do you think that's a right way to live? Well, it's nice if it happens. I think it's possible. I think that there are probably extreme, extreme forms of emotionality where people get involved with one another and commit for a lifetime and, and, and live by it. And I think they're probably pure people than I am. I don't think I'm clean enough to do that. Well, it's happened a couple of times, but I don't know when it's going to happen forever. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm not saying I'm looking forward to that. I'm not saying, I don't know if a lady can put up with me forever. Well, it seems ridiculous on the one hand to say, well, uh, forever. You know what I mean? <laughs> hey, listen, I don't want to know nobody forever. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so people themselves, all of their carbon and all of their oxygen and all of their nitrogen and sulfur and silicon and phosphorus, all the chemical elements that are within them, came from a star. So in a sense, everything that we see, every body that we see, everything in this beautiful, wonderful jewel of creation called planet Earth is itself stardust. We all come from the same cosmic source. What gives you your sense of identity now? Race, religion, sex? Well, us Italians are pretty good with women. We have, a, we have a way, we have a charm. We call it a guinea charm, whatever you want to call it. And uh, I think we're about the, the, the finest race there is for women. What do you think about it? <laughs> no, I, no, I knew this man had lost his goddamn mind. The, the, the Italians are the best? That's well, how come the blacks have more kids? <laughs> I mean, we got to be doing just a little more fucking. Well, we we get yeah, plenty of women. Yeah. Well, how many black women you see not pregnant? <laughs> huh? I see. They say the only way you get a Italian woman to stop fucking is marry. That's a good point. Because of my ethnicity and my background as a Puerto Rican, and money never became an incentive. It was never a motivation. He was the, the, the Puerto Rican people, my people. You know. I was brought up in great comfort, and I was brought up with great love, family, always the mixture of the Jewish aspect, Yiddishkeit, Jewishness, and the secular aspect. Whenever, when we were young in Brooklyn, there, there was uh, every, every couple of neighborhoods, every couple of blocks had their own bunch of guys. But were you, you were Italian, were you fighting against Italians? We were fighting Irish and blacks. So who shot you? An Irish guy. <laughs> shot me, on the, uh, shot me on, the, on the church steps of St. Brendan's Cathedral. That's where we had the fight, right on the steps of the church. And what were you fighting over? They had walked into our neighborhood. The Nazis came in, 
Jewish businesses were closed. Um, everything was taken away. It started with money, with gold, with this, with radios, with bicycles. Next thing was they took the Jews and put them in the ghettos. I mean, this went one, two, three. A lot of black students who come into Columbia and they change. And they act the same way as the white students would act. And they just blend right in, so there's no conflict. But no, not me. I'm there, big, black. <laughs> there was a sergeant that used to come every morning uh, to special serv services, and were boxers and ball players and, you know, athletes. And he would say, Herb, get up, car, get up. Hey, speak, get up. Nigger, get up. I didn't know what that meant. I thought that the guy was being nice with this nickname for me and for my friend who was black. What about your being black? Does that... I'm brown. Brown. Yeah, okay. I'm a brown man. Does that start your identity? Is that the first thing you use to identify yourself? Well, you yourself? know, the theory they have about black men is that all black men are well gifted. This is untrue. This is quite untrue. However, in my case, I was gifted. I do thank God for that now. Thank you. And at 12 at night, the black guy woke me up. I said, you know, I've been thinking about what you're going to do tomorrow. That's my duty to do. I'm black. I've been here longer than you. You didn't even know what that meant. <laughs> I want to hate the guy. I said, no, nah, we began to argue. We flip a coin. And then it was me who was going to hate the guy. They took about 20 Jews hostages in my city. They were all prominent uh, businessmen, bankers, uh, writers, Jews of some means, uh, intellectual and economic. My father was among them. So he was in jail while my mother and I were in the ghetto. So the following morning, the guy came in and he said, come on, Herb, and you call and the boxers and the ball players. And then he said, when he came to me, he said, come on, speak. Come on, nigger. And I got up and my friend got up and he held him in the back. And I told everyone there, out. There were no witnesses there. The guy got out, the guy says, you are dead. This is the sergeant. Come on, let go. You are dead. Come on, let go. I came over. I slapped him in the face. I spit on his face. I hit him a left hook here, a right punch here, and a left hook here, and he was dead. We pick him up, put him in bed. He was bleeding in the ears, the nose, the mouth. The town of Siget was emptied of Jews in four transports. Um, I believe it was a transport per week. In other words, within four weeks, there were no more Jews left in my town. I went to the Olympic Games, I came back, and th this guy came to me and says, Mr. Torres, you're not supposed to stand here. You're a special guest of the President of the United States because I won a silver medal. And you're a guest and you, you're supposed to sit down. We serve you. I said, Jesus, Christ, you know, you look familiar. And the guy says, I will never forget you, Mr. Torres. I said, why? He said, you broke my jaw in three places. And, and he called me Mr. Yeah, yeah. Torres. I think my background gave me my first sense of identity. I was from a very large family, and uh, my role was pretty well defined very early. Having been in a religious community, one didn't always have full choices about what one, let's say, chose to study. So I suppose in one way I came to philosophy, well, through mathematics, but also through uh, being uh, invited, I suppose, or told to go and study philosophy. <laughs> I'm much more influenced, I think, by the fact that my father was in the army than by the fact that he was German Catholic. I grew up in Illinois, southern Illinois, near East St. Louis, Illinois. It was clear in those days. The skies were dark enough so that we could see the Milky Way and a lot of the beautiful things that were in the sky. It was good. It was good. You know, I had an easy life. I never had to work or, or do anything. And then uh, as I gr grew older, the uh, shit hit the fan, so to speak, when I got into my 30s and I realized that I had to come, come out of this uh, bag of uh, nothingness. As I look around me and as I experience my own life, it's really tough to escape early conditioning. I mean, I was brainwashed. I'm a brainwashed guy. I think at a fairly young age, I was pretty aware that the uh, global situation was not in the best of shape. And it was really around a sense of uh, mission, I guess we would call it, or a sense of trying to see if there was some way I could participate in uh, this world becoming a better place. 
I was born and raised in Anchorage, Alaska, third generation, and uh, was, uh, you know, a kid who ran around and did wild and crazy things, basically lived in the library and stole cars. I was second oldest in a family of 11 children, and I was the only girl, and I was really a second mother, a nurturer, caretaker. I really was dying inside, and I was becoming a al total alcoholic. I would lose jobs uh, in very nice, good organizations, and they let me go very in a very nice way because I, I was young. I worked in construction for a while when I was young, when I first got married. And uh, my marriage failed, and uh, I started running with the wrong type of guys, and uh, I found myself doing a lot of bad things. What'd you do? Arm um, robberies. Taking off bookmakers. That was a crazy kid. I knew from the age of 10 that I would leave and never go back. I came from a family that was uh, and is extremely religious. Southern Baptist, fundamental Christians hit you in the head in the morning and make you pray at night. It was a lot of fun. Go to church three times a week, get on your knees on a concrete floor, thank God for the fact that he didn't kill you that day. Made you feel good about life. Uh, very strong teaching which I attuned to very easily was that about the mystical body of Christ which was a sense of uh, the world really groaning for salvation and the whole world being somehow uh, up for salvation. They made it real clear that we were all born evil nasty dirty people and then if we hung on long enough in this life God would give it all back to us in the next one. I knew they were full of shit and I wanted to get out of there as fast as I could. I left Memphis, Tennessee. And why did you leave? I left because, um, first of all, I, I dropped out of school. I wasn't really interested in school. And my father, when I was two years old, was, um, he was sentenced to prison. And um, he left my mother and four children besides myself. And one day I woke up in Miami. I went on a safari just on an escape trip down there and I woke up and I was a total, totally different person. I pissed in bed, for instance, and I really regressed back to infancy. So I come to New York to see my father and another guy comes to the table looking exactly like me, but he's 6'4", and he pulls a chair out and he says, uh, can I sit here? No, this is me and my father table. He said, that's my father too. My lifestyle at this point is very different from the monastic. I lived a fairly strict uh, life for a long time um, with an external discipline imposed also, but eventually one internalizes most of that. I did time at Sing Sing, Auburn, Walk Hill. I did time all over. Which was the least pleasant? None of them are real special. I realized at 18 I, you have to knock off from all the shit that you took or got screwed up, you know, from what happened to you as a child. And I do believe that because you can't improve, you can't get any better unless you cut them off and say, okay, their parents screwed them, so you got screwed. I decided I wanted to be a world-class soloist when I was about eight. and. Um, began entering competitions whenever I had the opportunity and I won my first national competition when I was 12. I would describe my paintings as, uh, as looking for identity in a whole new shape of a figure, a figurative shape. In other words, I'm looking for a, n a person that doesn't really exist maybe in another, uh, in another world because I was so disappointed with uh, my world. What does music mean to you? Is it your salvation? Is it your solace? Or is it a profession? I think uh, more than anything, it's um, the truest form of expression for what my spirit is.
I'm trying to get at who people are, who they really are. People walk around assuming they exist, and I think that that's uh, only a partially provable assumption. I think that the self people present is very tenuous. My full name, Gennaro Anthony Sirico, Jr. And people call you? I'm stuck with the name Jr. You don't like it? I'm 45 years old, would you like it? Yeah, I'm six foot 11 inches of steel and sex appeal and I try to live up to that. Helplessness set in the first minute. The doors of the cattle cars were swung open, but we didn't know it. We just didn't know it. We were still human beings civilized. We still had our dignity. We were still embarrassed if, if, if somebody had to urinate because we were standing in, uh, in Celapel, that means roll calls, and we were not permitted to go to move for hours. Are you saying then that the eye is sort of ephemeral or it's like yes, something that, it's, that emerges that it, that it and is it's not really important? Yes, that underneath this construction is nothing, just as behind the beginning of the universe is nothing. When I'm stripped away and I'm all the way down to bare existence, I think there's still something there besides me, what pushing me. I think there's a God within all of us. But I mean, I feel like somebody's always home there, even if I'm not aware of it. Uh, Maybe that sounds kind of schizophrenic. Well, I think it Maybe is. It sounds like somebody else. I think home. it is. Yes. <laughs> well, I've experienced different selves. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I'm probably enough of, or too much of a philosopher to uh, let go of the old Greek sense that somehow, if there's nothing, then why something? It's not a question of believing in other lives, past lives, future lives. It, it's not about Shirley MacLaineism with me, but it is about a strong feeling that I'm not my body. God, I hope I'm not my body, because it ain't getting any better. I have a physical entity. I mean, body and bones and all that make me the physical structure that I am seated before you. But in addition to the physical, there is, a, a, I'll call it a spirituality, a spirit, something that gives verb to everything that this physical entity can do. Why is it that, that uh, some, some people are, are uh, thrilled by certain sounds and others are, are bored or, or it makes them uncomfortable even? It's this difference in, in, in spirits, I believe. Sometimes it happens that uh, <clears throat> I feel like I'm detached from myself. I, that's why I, uh, I believe in God. Can you imagine that eye disintegrating so there was nothing there at all anymore? No, because I'm too strong of a personality to disintegrate. He will turn up in another way, in another form. So there is no end. And that those people that have a very strong sense of I, strong egos, a strong sense of self-direction and focus, are essentially aware that underneath the belief structures and the philosophies and the attitudes and, and the wants and desires is basically a fucking void. Are you aware of something else? Is there something else behind that I? I might. I want to. I will. I won't. What about some people do and some don't. Some will and some won't. Some can, some can't, some is and some ain't. I is. I was a kid going through so many changes regarding the Bible and Jesus Christ and the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost and all that stuff, somehow it came into my mind that I would lock myself in the bathroom and say my own name over and over into the mirror. Don't know where I got the idea, except I did it. And I became absolutely nothing. You say your sense of identity was erased when you were in Auschwitz. Is there even now a void, an emptiness you feel behind the self, behind the I? Yes, yes, and it will always be the emptiness of knowing what a human being can be reduced to by other human beings. 
I, ha I have a hard time saying I, Charles. I, I feel I'm half there when I say that. I never, uh, ha I don't have the confidence. I never had any confidence. Where's the other half? It was t eaten up by my mother. And I remember being locked in the bathroom, sitting on the edge of the bathtub, having repeated mantra like my own name, Don Simpson, Don Simpson, until it became gibberish. A lot of people think it is today, by the way. Uh, and I had this absolute lack of sense of self. And I would have to sit down and literally regroup my point of view and my orientation. And I would have to travel back to wherever I thought I was when I started. And I remember almost not making it back on two occasions. I used to scream as I walked down the street. People used to look out of the window and think my mother was torturing me. And actually, they say she wasn't. I remember saying, I better stop this shit because I felt that I had this sense of personal power where I could destroy myself. We believe that the whole universe, at least one theory is, that the whole universe, which is now expanding, ultimately will begin to contract upon itself, and in so doing, it will annihilate itself back into the singularity from which it was born. Do you believe that that sense of self you have could collapse and disintegrate? Oh, it does often. As often as I have to reconstruct myself uh, almost hourly. It's always um, the problem of confronting that, of, of confronting the fact that you have sort of nothing potentially there. Um, are you afraid of insanity, of going insane? <laughs> Me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The women were lined up five in a row, and it was dark, and today I know, of course, the same thing happened with the men on an, uh, at another part of the square. And Mengele stood on a kind of a platform. Are you afraid of chaos and dread and mental disorder and madness? I don't think so. I don't think so. Oh, that's the thing that scares me the most. That's why I, don't, I never use drugs. That's why I never drink, you know, not even a glass of wine. I have a beer once in a while, but wine makes me a little dizzy, and I feel a losing control of my head. I do like altered states of consciousness, but I like remaining me at the same time. I have a great fear of going insane. I uh, have come pretty close to it at one point in my life, and it was horrible. It was terrifying. When was that? I lost my oldest child, Mary Christine. She was killed almost three years ago, and uh, I think I came pretty close then. I've always, always been able to uh, kind of teeter on the precipice in a sense of whatever, self-survival, drive, desire, and desire is an interesting one. Something is a kind of uh, celestial cord that pulls me back, that reels me back in. Were you hospitalized? Oh, yes, once. W what for? A dissolution of the self. And um, how did you put yourself back together again? Like Humpty Dumpty. I, I never really put myself back together again. I put something different back together again. The self continues to change. I must have known that I'm looking at, at evil incarnate, that I'm looking at Malachamovas, the angel of death. I must have known because we did what he told us to do when he came to look at us, five women standing there. I had my hand around my mother's shoulder and my mother was a much younger woman than I am today. And he looked at us, and he said, Mutter und Tochter, meaning mother and daughter. And we said, yeah. And that was it. I really was very anxious to lose myself and go insane. It seemed as if it would be the kindest way out for me. That night, we were taken to be disinfected. All our clothes were taken away. We were shorn, stripped naked. 
given some rags. It was a terrible night. It was a night that I will never forget. Do you carry around a sense of chaos inside? Chaos? That would be, no, that's too dramatic a word. A mild untidiness, perhaps, but not chaos. What are you frightened of? Being alone, I guess. Dying alone? Living alone? Yeah. Being alone, you know. I've been alone a long time in my... the way I see things, you know. I have a family and whatnot, but... I got a big wall up. Some of what you describe as the touch with non-reality or with non-existence, maybe, I see more as, or I experience more as a reaching for uh, the communal self or for the larger or the broader sense of human identity. And so the letting go for me uh, is experiencing that commonness. I don't know why the tattoo made such a terrible, terrible impression on me where I, I, I sensed without really knowing that this is, that I am beyond the pale of humanity, that I am somewhere where I, I, no human being can be. I felt that I was stripped, and I was stripped of my identity. I was not Barbara Fishman or Baba Fishman as my name was at that time. I was a cipher, I was a number. I would uh, be more nervous about uh, being debilitated uh, physically rather than mentally. I took my tin cup and put it behind me because there was the kettle, there was the SS with the ladle and he lifted the soup in the ladle and chunks of meat dropped back into the kettle and I remember it, as, as the soup splashed back, it splashed on my face and I had the urge to lick my lips because I could see it was a thick soup. It had chunks of meat and bits of potato. And my hand was this, with the tin cup behind my back and I shook my head. I hated the army so much that one time I was sitting down and I was watching friends of mine playing play cards, and suddenly I found myself in a state that I could not move. It was like a it was like a catatonic state, and I could not move. And I tried to scream, and I could not scream. And then I tried to relax, and for about 30 seconds, I could not move. I think of that moment. And I know that there must have been some spark, some, something higher than I was able to get in touch with that made me refuse the most essential thing to my living. And that was apparently not food, but the need to say no to the defiler. The, the only time when I, I become absolutely frustrated and I have no control over any emotion is when someone dies. Sweetheart, we can't worry about that. That is something that happens and then goodbye. It's over and out. Did you ever kill anybody? No. Why not? Why didn't I kill anybody? Yeah. That's a funny question. <laughs> well, how can I answer that? <laughs> Truthfully. <laughs> No, I didn't kill nobody. I would kill someone with absolutely no compunction if they transgressed me. I mean, if someone threatened my life and they were going to kill me, next, they're gone. Are you capable of murder? No, no, I'm not. I think I'm the type that could be murdered. I'm just the, just the opposite. Do you have murder and rage in your soul? In astonishing quantities. I think if I had to defend one of my children or someone else I love, my husband, I would probably be able to kill. I mean, I have seen people killed. 
Uh, and I've seen them killed in, in the act of self-defense, not by me, by somebody else. It was justified, and you know what? That's showbiz. Is it ever morally justifiable to kill? I think not. Even in self-defense? Mm -hmm. I've not been tested on that one, so I, it may be a bit glib. I, I don't, you know, it's very easy to respond on a language level to certain things where one hasn't been tested. So I've not been in war. I've not been attacked. If someone offered you a million dollars to kill a stranger right now, would you do it? No. No, I wouldn't do it. Why not? I don't need the money. Are you ready to die right now? No, absolutely not. If you got any ideas, keep them to yourself. Are you afraid to die? No. The last thing on my mind. You ready to die? Oh, yeah. Yeah. That doesn't, that doesn't frighten me at all. Are you eager to die? <laughs> I used to be. I, I lived a life. Well, I think that I am a hypochondriac. And that came from my life as a boxer. Uh, I became a quasi-narcissist when I was a boxer because, you know, I had to be in good condition, both mentally and physically. And whenever something goes wrong, because I didn't know that I'm 51, when something goes wrong, I panic. I really don't believe in my own death. I mean, there are degrees of belief. I put it this way, I believe in the deaths of my friends much more readily than I do in myself. I'm not ready to leave all that I love here, but I have no fear of dying. Are you afraid of death? No, I don't think so. Are you ready to die? Uh, I'd like to say yes. I'm not sure that that's so. Um, I think about it fairly frequently um, and think, you know, particularly about not wasting my life. I mean, I'm much too phobic to ever have any kind of serene attitude towards death. I mean, I'm, uh, no, not at all. Would you say there is panic and hysteria right under the surface of your being? Yeah. Death, if it's going to visit me, I hope it comes in the night and just strikes me down. Mary Christine kissed me goodbye, told me I was the best mother in the world, and got on her bike, went out, crossed the street, rode down to the water. I kept asking the woman in charge uh, of the block where I had been assigned to, where is my, when am I going to see my mother? She didn't respond. And I kept badgering her, when, when? And finally she said, she took my head and she said, look. And I looked and there was a, the chimney of which I was aware all along, and black smoke, of which I was aware all along. And I said, yeah, so when am I going to see my mother? There she goes, or there she went. She was hit as she crossed the street. Someone had waved her on and indicated that she was safe. And a car came from the other direction and hit her. She was unconscious when I got to her, and I believe she was dead. I, I reacted to her at that time, very soon after I saw her, as if she were dead. Um, I wanted to lie down next to her. I hoped the next car would hit me. I was uh, married for 11 months. Yeah. And after 11 months, I decided uh, this is not going to work. Me and my wife both decided this is not going to be a beautiful girl. And I get moved all the way out to Utah. And they call me one night and they say, uh, Mr. Dawkins, your wife just committed suicide. And I'm like, hey, you know, this is a dirty trick to play on somebody. And somebody else called me from the news station. So at that point, I'm like totally confused. Yeah. And eventually I call her mother and I say, well, what's going on? I couldn't understand the word her mother said. So from that point, I knew it was true. And I felt empty and lost inside. It's very difficult in a marriage to lose a child because men and women grieve so differently. And my dear husband waited to make sure that I was going to survive before he 
grieved in, in his own way. I was raised by a mother who um, was always talking about how, you know, she was into Zen Buddhism and, well, my father was a Catholic, she was a Zen Buddhist, and um, she would always talk about how it was fine. She didn't want to get old, but she didn't mind dying. And she would often, when she'd go on away on a trip, she would leave, make out a new will. And I found a couple of them, and one had a picture of her in heaven, and it said, wish you were here. I looked up this man and I said, I know that my father was with you in the cattle car. And when they took you out from there and you were on the square, which way did he go, left or right? Left meaning death and Left right. was death, right was life. And he looked at me and he shook his head. And I said, well, tell me, he went to the right, right? My father died a brave man. He was dying for five years. I just lost him last year. Uh, matter of fact, I stayed with him the whole year prior to his passing away. And that's when I got close to my father. My father was a great guy. I'm, I, I'm like my father. He, he never expressed himself. There was a lot of love in him, but you know, the, he held it in. The last year was, I had a wonderful time with him. Where, 45 years, I caught up with it in one year. He never said peep. He never said peep. And he suffered for quite a, quite a many years, five years. I have absolutely afraid to die. Are you afraid that you might exist afterward in some kind of hell? Yes, definitely. I, I feel I, I would go to hell. You can be a terrible guy all your life, and when you get 40 years old, God can call you. You can be them, been with every prostitute, did every drug, had a hell of a time. God called you at age 40, you turn into a preacher, you can still go to heaven. How old are you now? I'm 31. I got nine years, God. <laughs> I got nine more years, please. What about heaven and hell? Do you have any belief in that? We have it right here, every day. Well, I just think that we're all here for a short time and then the certain people who did certain things in their lives will go one place and, and the people who have, a, have, have incredible souls, they live on. I hope not. I really do. Because I can't imagine any afterlife that wouldn't be remarkably tedious. Once you die, everything doesn't just go kaflooey. You know, I think that there, there is some order to a consciousness. Do you believe in a heaven and a hell? I don't spend a lot of time on that one. Uh, if they're not there, um, I guess I'd go sort of with the Pascalian and Jamesian wager. You know, you make the most of what you have here and... Find out later. Yeah, yeah. I know after you did it doesn't make any difference. So this is all play talk. I think that there's probably a revelatory experience awaiting everyone that has to do with finding out who and what you really are. And I think when that occurs, if it occurs, you reach nirvana-heaven. And the degree to which you don't reach that place of realization, you're in an eternal hell. Is this the person speaking who's abandoned his origins? I never said I'd abandoned my origins. I said I was running away from them eternally. I keep looking up. I keep looking at the vastness, the, the uh, universe, the part that I don't understand. I don't know where all those souls are, really, but I have a very strong belief that she is certainly alive. Do you want to have children? Uh, no. You want to know why? Yes. <laughs> I'm, it's not an aggressive thing that I don't want to or something. First of all, I think I'm too old now. I'm 47. Um, I mean, I know medically I'm not too old, but... You know, that seems like the moment has passed when, and I would have if I had been with the right guy or something when I was at age, I thought it would be a good thing, but. Never had the desire. Um, I think it's probably a function of growing up in a family which was, as discussed, extremely rigid and very family oriented. And it uh, played with my notion of family. All I saw that came out of family life was pain. Pain and obligation and false ritual. Absolutely unconditional love. I give up my life for my children. I don't think I'd be a good mother to children now. I mean, I'm just too, I want to do what I want to do. And kids sense. see your God-given qualities. They see your innermost beauty. The, if a kid doesn't like you, you still got a chance of winning that kid. 
if a adult doesn't like you, you got no shot at winning. No shot whatsoever. A kid will see you and say, you're a bum. You stay at this camp a couple of days, you have fun with the kids and all that, and say, you know, you're not that bad. My being a mother and my functioning to the best of my abilities to me means that, bluntly put, Hitler didn't succeed. In fact, my son is my future. Without him, there, there wouldn't be really w worth talking in the future tense. Do you accept your existence on the planet with a certain peace of mind? Well, I accept my existence. Um, I don't accept the situation that I find myself in on this planet. No, I think that's a real struggle. Yeah. The situation being? That I live in a culture which is uh, permeated by dominance and oppression. Uh, and that's not only within my culture, but it's around the world. What do you want from the rest of your life? Well, I often thought that I would buy me a yacht, put three or four girls on it, just cruise around the world and just party. But my mother seems to think that there's some other things that God has planned for me to do. Until that happens, I don't know. In the meantime, my plans still sit on the yacht, okay, drinking champagne out of slippers and having eat away bathing suits and this kind of shit, you know. So what will end the earth? That which we believe will cause it to end will be the behavior of our fantastic star, the sun. It has been in existence some five and a half billion years, living the way it is now as a beautiful golden light slowly coursing across the daylight from east to west. It will stay that way for another five billion years or so. And then the nuclear fuel within its heart, way deep inside, will begin to burn out. I have had a good run, and I've had a better time than most. I don't think I can ask too much more. I'll play a few more years, and I'll tilt my hat, and I'll be gone. When you're gone, nobody remembers you now. Wilt Chamberlain, the greatest player to ever play, what did they say? You remember Wilt? Wilt who? So our star, which is gold and yellow today, will become orange and red as it expands and expands. And it will reach out all the way to the orbit of Mercury and swallow Mercury up, and eventually out to the orbit of Venus and swallow Venus up, and eventually out to the orbit of Earth and swallow the Earth and the Moon, and the Earth will die. Can you envision an end of the universe where there's nothing again? Never, never. I think it will change. I, I don't think it will disappear entirely. I think it will go on forever. Will it end around the turn of the century with my demise? At the end there will be nothing. There will be no atoms, no molecules, no subatomic particles, no thing at all, nothing at the end. Do you live on in some way after death? Well, I'd like to think so, just to wear the shit out of a few people, you know what I mean? No story. Right. No right, script. Right, right. No actors. Right. The big madness, the right, death. Right, right. Sex, uh, yeah. uh, The beginning, the end of the right, world. Right, right. Who's going to pay money to come to see this?